Welcome back, A Pushers for Progressive Era Notes Part 2. Right, so um, this next section we're going to do is it's going to be stuff where we're going to divide things up between Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, William Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. Right, so that's kind of our part two, if you will, um, with what's happening with these three particular presidents. Right, so we're going to start off here with Teddy. Right. And on our slide here, these are just the things that are happening while he is in office. So like we've already talked about the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. Right. That was in the part one video. Um, so this stuff is happening, but we're not going to talk about this because we already did. But this kind of gives you an order of these are all things happening when Teddy is president. Right. So our very first thing is going to be the square deal. Right. Um, so with this, um, we're going to watch a little video here. I am adjusting the vol volume, so hopefully it will be better than uh, the first video uh, that I tried out. But um, think of this as he calls it the square deal because there's the phrase um, something is fair and square. So think of that phrase. All right. If something is fair and square, that means it's fair for everyone involved. Right. And so we're going to see some examples with this with the coal strike of 1902. Right. And they're going to talk about this a little bit in that particular video. Right. So I'm going to try this out, guys. All right, so with our coal strike here, right, we're just going to kind of go over what was in that video. Um, and so this, again, is a coal strike, all right? The miners want what most of our workers are going to want. They're going to want better hours, better pay, better conditions, because mining is extremely dangerous. And obviously, the corporation is not going to want to do those things because they're going to lose money. So since you have most people are using coal, um, in our cartoon here, we have... Um, Uncle Sam, so the United States, right, and he is pointing to the freezing public, right, and we kind of saw in our video that is what Roosevelt was focusing on, is that he was going to threaten both of these groups, right, because it needs to be fair and square for everyone involved, and that's not just the workers and the owner, but also the American people who need this coal. So the biggest um, takeaway from our coal strike is it is the very first time that the United States government sides on the side of workers and not a corporation. So this is a huge turning point in how people are now starting to think about the national government is that they think now that the national government really should help them in times of crisis right it should not just be left to um uh, corporations or people trying to figure things out on their own right now we're going to talk about a lot of different laws here 
right? This guy here, this is Taft, right? So um, William Taft is going to be the vice president of the United States under Teddy Roosevelt, right? So we're going to see some pictures here and there of him. Again, if you recognize people in a cartoon, it makes life a whole lot easier to figure out what's going on with that cartoon. So in our cartoon with Taft, right, he has his hand out like he's stopping all of our railroads. So the Elkins Act is going to be dealing with railroads, right? So basically what it is, is that it makes it illegal for railroads to take um, secret rebates from freight charges. So basically it's the idea that we're saying anyone who's shipping anything on a railroad should be charged the same price, no matter who they are or what corporation or whoever that who they ever might be. So all of these guys all have to stop. You all get charged the same amount, right? No one gets any favoritism. Okay, so everything should be the same. This is very similar to some of the stuff we talked about with the populist movement, right, in the Gilded Age, and how those farmers wanted everybody to be charged the exact same rate. So basically, no more favoritism, everyone should charge the exact same, okay? All right, our next one is the Hepburn Act, right? And so here we have the bill. Obviously, it looks a little beat up. Lots of things are being added to it, right, as it goes from the Senate back to the House, right? And anytime you see a little teddy bear in a cartoon, that's going to be Teddy Roosevelt. We're going to get to why he's going to be nicknamed um, with the teddy bear and everything like that in a little bit, right? So for the Hepburn Act, okay, it's going to be the first time that we're going to see a maximum freight rate, that is going to be um, allowed, right? So you have kind of like a ceiling put on how much you can charge somebody to ship something, right? You can't charge them extraordinary amounts. Everybody has a ceiling to that. Um, and it's going to expand the idea that the government now can be uh, using that ICC, that Interstate Commerce Commission that we saw with the Wabash versus Illinois case in last unit. So we're taking a lot of stuff from last unit and putting it in here. So the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, means the national government controls trade between states. And now with this, we have all these amendments, all these additions, they added on that now the national government can control pipelines, right, and bridges and ferries. So like ferries, like ferry boats. Um, so now it's not just railroads. So it's railroads, pipelines, bridges and ferries. Now we're all gonna be controlled by that federal government. And think about with bridges and um, uh, boat ferries, they're going usually between states. So that's where the national government saying, we're going to control these modes of transportation um, and the movement of goods as well. So again, all these little amendments we keep adding on to the ICC. And again, the ICC is that Interstate Commerce Commission. So the commission that's controlling trade between the states. Okay. And now let's get on to that teddy bear thing. All right. So the conservation movement here right, is at first, when we first look at it with our 21st century brains, we think about the environmentalist movement. Um, it sort of is, but it's also sort of not, right? So Teddy Roosevelt, let's start with the story with our little cartoon over here, right? So Teddy Roosevelt, he's an avid hunter. Um, he's been to Africa a couple times on these big hunting trips, right? Very much an outdoorsy woodsman type of person. Um, and there were some photographers from a newspaper wanted to get a really good picture of him shooting a bear, right? And so they came up with this idea, let's bring a little baby bear, because obviously they couldn't take a large adult bear, um, and we're going to have him shoot it, and we'll take this really cool picture. Well, he's... He might be a hunter, but he's not, you know, he's not just like wanting to kill things. He wants to actually have the experience of hunting. Um, and that shooting a baby is not, that's not what he does. All right, that is not hunting. So he, in this cartoon, he refuses to shoot the bear. Um, and then in all of our, uh, like, different department stores, they start making these little stuffed bears and start calling them teddy bears after President Theodore Roosevelt. So your teddy bears that are with you right now when you're at home are actually named after this particular president of the United States, the 26th president of the U.S., is where you get the name teddy bears from, um, which is pretty darn cool, right, and adorable, right? So this conservation movement thing, where I was saying it wasn't really an environmentalist movement, right, it's a little bit different, is that he wants to conserve materials for the future. So he's not saying, let's not cut down the forest. He's saying, yeah, you can cut down the forest, but let's plant some more forests or conserve some of those materials so we have more forests to cut down later. Like, let's not hunt all the bears because I want to be able to have my great-grandchildren hunt bears too. So again, a little bit different from an environmentalist point of view that we won't see until the 1960s. Um, 
1960s, 1970s, when we get to like a modern environmentalist movement, right? So his right-hand man in this whole uh, conservative uh, conservation movement is Gifford Pinchot, right? And so Gifford Pinchot, he's going to be the head of Division of Forestry, right? And so he's going to be, anytime you see this guy's name, it's going to be involved with, um, with this conservation movement. Right. Him and Roosevelt are going to be working on creating the first national parks. So here you got Roosevelt here in a picture, and this is going to be Yellowstone National Park. It's going to be one of the very first parks that is going to be created. All right. He's also going to be um, establishing the Redwood National Forest. So here is a picture of a redwood with a Subaru driving through it. Um, this tree still exists, but you can't drive a car through it uh, anymore because, um, you know, they thought maybe that might be dangerous. Um, and then we have our Forest Reserve Act. Again, we're reserving forests for the future, right? We don't want to cut them all down. So again, limiting how much we are uh, destroying. Okay, um, here's some other pictures. Um, so here you got um, uh, Roosevelt next to one of the largest trees in the world. Um, and this is one of the um, giant sequoias. Um, and so he's gonna set up Sequoia National Park. And this uh, tree is actually gonna be named after General Sherman uh, from the Civil War. Um, so you got all of your, like how tall this thing is, how far it is around, everything like that. Um, and these trees are, you know, thousands and thousands of years old. Um, if you ever get a chance, definitely go out to Northern California to go see these trees. It is really a really awesome experience. Now, normally if we were in class, we would totally do this, all right? Um, if you get 17 people holding hands stretched out, um, that's how far around the bottom of this tree is. Um, it's really cool. Obviously we're social distancing, so don't do that. Um, but it gives you an idea of how big these trees are, um, which is pretty spectacular and cool. All right. Okay. Our next person is William Howard Taft, all right? So for this particular president, we're going to talk about these items here, all right? And for Taft, when he is getting elected, um, so Roosevelt has left office. Um, he is off on a trip to Africa to go hunting. Um, there are... To give you an idea of how some people didn't really care for what uh, Roosevelt was doing, especially these big business owners, is that there is a quote from J.P. Morgan that he said when he found out that uh, that Roosevelt was going off to Africa, is he said, let the lion do his duty. So this idea of like he wanted the lion to kill Roosevelt. Um, obviously, him and Roosevelt didn't get along very well. Um, but Roosevelt did tell Taft right, is um, follow all the things that I've been doing. Just kind of keep on keeping on, all right? So there are political ads that say, take advice from Teddy. So that's a good way to help us remember what is Taft supposed to do? He's supposed to take advice from Teddy, right? Um, he's going to see some of the things he does are going to be exactly what Roosevelt had done. Um, other things, not so much, okay? So let's dive in. All right, so we start off with the election of 1908. So this is when Taft will get elected, right? Our Republican platform, right? Conservation of resources, strengthening the Interstate Commerce Commission, right? The Democrats were gonna have William Jennings Bryan running again, right? Remember, he was going to be running as the Populist Party represent, representative that also worked with the Democratic Party, right? And they're gonna to wanna to lower, lower tariffs. Um, the AFL, remember that's the American Federation of Labor, supported the Democrats here, and they opposed court injunctions against labor action. So that's definitely a callback to the Pullman strike and what happened there. And then we have a third party candidate here. We're gonna see him a lot, right? So the leader of the Socialist Party of the United States is this guy named Eugene Debs. In this particular election, he won almost a half a million votes. And it's really showing how the working class are not happy with what's going on, right? They appreciate some of the things that the people in office are doing, but they need more. Things are becoming very, very desperate. So this guy, Eugene Debs, right, or Eugene V. Debs, because um, that's his middle name, uh, we will see him pop up quite a lot here. Right. So Taft gets elected, and the first thing we see is a controversy, right? So remember, anytime you see Pinchot, that is dealing with the conservation movement, right? So this Ballard-Pinchot controversy. Basically what's going on is that uh, Ballard was um, selling off some of these forestry lands that were being protected. Um, he's making money off of it, and Pinchot finds out. So Pinchot goes to Taft and tells him, hey, like, this is this is going on. This shouldn't happen. And he's um, he's basically tattletaling on Ballinger. 
Well, Taft, since he was probably making money off of this, told Pinchot, like, mind your own business, and that's not part of your job. So Pinchot, being the conservationist he is, goes to the press, right, releases all this information, and then Taft, once he finds out what Pinchot has done, fires him, right? So this is not, this is not good, right? And so here we got a quote from a book, right, where a historian said that the, uh, the affair had more impact on politics than it did on conservation. Taft had been carry, uh, elected to carry out Roosevelt's policies, and his opponent said that he was carrying them out on a stretcher. So that idea of like, he was not helping out these policies at all. Um, and again, that idea of carrying out on the stretcher, right? He's basically killing these policies. So even though we have these progressive presidents, there is still some of this corruption that is still happening um, throughout our politics at the time. Okay, all right. Here we have another law, all right? It's one of our last ones for this particular section, but we're gonna see some more, right? It's you know, when we're having, trying to make change, we got to make lots of laws. So we have a Man Elkins Act, right? And so again, we got the Interstate Commerce Commission, totally makes sense. So this is going to again add to that ICC. And now we're going to add in telephone and telegraph to what the ICC can control. So right now, your ICC is also part of the FCC, the Federal um, Communications Commission, right? And so your cell phone is regulated because of this particular act, right? So we're adding telephone and telegra uh, telegraph to all of this. So before we added, um, we had railroads and then we added um, uh, ferries and bridges, right, and pipelines. And now we're adding telephones and telegraphs. So every law we're adding more to this. So kind of think of all of them as a large group of laws that are trying to add what the federal government is allowed to regulate to basically control these big monopolies. Okay. We are also going to have our 16th Amendment passed at this time, right? And this is income tax, right? Obviously, this artist does not feel income tax is good, right? It is weighing down on Lady Liberty here, right? Saying that she is a slave of liberty. Um, but again, to have all of these laws passed and to try and fix things, you need money to do it, right? And so that's what the income tax is all about. Okay. All right. Now, Roosevelt is, remember, he's off in Africa on this trip, and he hears all this stuff that Taft is not following his advice. And so he's coming back. Right? He tries to become the Republican nominee for president, and the Republicans are like, no, we have Taft. We like him. So he's going to create a new political party here. Right? And this new political party is the Progressive Party, which will get nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. Okay. All right. Um, and in this new party, he's going to have this idea of new nationalism, right, which has the heavy title of Hamiltonian means to achieve Jeffersonian ends. We're going to dive into what this means on the next slide. So hang on. All right. Okay. Now, with this new party, the progressive party he creates, right, it's going to be nicknamed the bull moose party because he, a bull moose is a male moose, a really, really big animal, right? And, um, you know, he's an avid hunter, so that kind of goes with his vibe. Um, but he was going to give a large speech to a bunch of people um, trying to get them to vote for him. And in that speech, he was um, shot. And so he had an assassination attempt. Um, he is only stopped from being killed because his speech was 50 pages folded in half in his breast pocket. And it stopped the bullet. Um, and he had blood all over him and everything like that. So like it stopped it from like getting to his heart, but he still was shot and injured. He continues on this speech with, you know, blood all over him, very theatrical, right? Um, and the quote is, it takes more than this to kill a bull moose. So hence bull moose party, all right? Um, now with this, uh, we do have some quotes from his son. So his son said to kind of give you a vibe for who this guy is and like how he would just go ahead and keep talking even after he's been shot, um, is that his son said that father loved to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. So the idea where he definitely wants to be the center of attention. Um, here we have a quick little um, grab from the Smithsonian uh, comparing Teddy Roosevelt to 50 Cent. Um, it's the Smithsonian, right? At least they, you know, have a good sense of humor, right? Now let's get back to this Hamiltonian means to achieve Jeffersonian ends. So first off, we're going to have a little review of Hamilton and Jefferson, because if we don't know what they're talking, what they stand for, this quote makes no sense whatsoever. All right. So Hamilton, 
He is a federalist, all right, and the federalists want federal government control, all right? So they want the federal government to have more control, and they fear too much state control would end up with fighting between those different states because every state has different ideas, all right? Jefferson, all right, is a Democratic Republican. He wants more state control and feared the power of a federal government, that if they had too much power, then it could become a tyranny or dictatorship, all right? And so the Democratic Republicans are strong supporters then of the creation of the Bill of Rights to protect citizens. All right, so there's our basic review. So if we take this quote, and then we take what Roosevelt really means, it's basically, he's like, I like Hamilton's ideas of federal control over here, and I'm gonna use that to protect citizens like Jefferson did over here. So if we would take this quote and put it into like more user-friendly language, it basically would mean that the federal government should use its power to protect citizens. So essentially what, Je what Hamilton and Jefferson are saying is that we're putting these two things together with Roosevelt, right? Roosevelt sees what's going on with the American public and he realizes that the only way to make this fair for everyone across the country is for the federal government to do it, not state by state, because some states are going to do a good job, other states are not. And so this is um, this idea of federal government stepping in to protect the people. Um, and this is something where you can definitely kind of feel a vibe with this with our current situation in the United States. Um, this idea of like, should the federal government step in to protect the citizens as a whole? Should it be state by state? What's going on? So we are seeing kind of a little divide here, a nice little review, if you would, of the philosophies of Hamilton and Jefferson with our current situation, All right? So, you know, history tends to repeat itself, okay? All right, so we're gonna move on to our next election. The election of 1912. Um, this election, we have four different people running, all right? So we have the Democrats, all right? So I put Eeyore here because he is a donkey, all right? So Wilson is a Democrat, all right? We have the Bull Moose Party here with Roosevelt. So I put, um, <laughs> I put our Bull Moose over here, all right? Um, we got Taft here with the Republicans, all right? So we got Dumbo and then the Socialists with Debs, all right? So we have four people running. This is a very unusual thing to happen, all right? And we're gonna see how this kind of plays out with this election. So we had new nationalism here for Roosevelt. So we already talked about that. The socialists with Debs are going to get almost a million votes. So we still have a lot of social unrest happening, right? New freedom is what Wilson's gonna talk about. And so we have that we are not put into this world to sit still and know, we are put in it to act. So the idea very similar to this new nationalism idea. These two guys' ideas are very, very similar. This idea that the federal government should do something, right? Taft over here, right, his idea is a little bit different, right? So he's attacking Wilson's and Roosevelt's progressive ideology, so ideology or ideas, is that the government cannot create good times. It cannot make the rain to fall, the sun to shine, or the crops to grow. But too many meddlesome regulations could deny the nation the prosperity it deserves. So he's kind of taking a back seat, saying like maybe the gov national government shouldn't do so much, right? Now, with this particular election, this is what we would call a splinter election, right? Because Roosevelt over here was a Republican. We have a Republican over here. So if you are voting for a Republican, you don't, you're like, should I go for this guy? Should I go for this guy? I don't know. They're splitting the votes. So if you split the votes between these two guys, who's going to win? The other one, right? So Wilson will win this election. Definitely put a star next to Wilson. So here's some political cartoons from the time. So this little chart at the bottom, I think does a good job with showing us that it is a splinter election. So this idea of what we have the um, Republicans here are divided by the bull moose, right? And so that means that since you're not going to have everyone, people are dividing their vote between these two parties, right? That the Democrats will win, right? Um, also, this is one of the elections when um, Debs is going to be running from prison. Um, and so here is his... Uh, um, campaign button, uh, voting for president, uh, convict number 9653. All right, so some interesting stuff going on in that election for sure. All right, okay, so Wilson is president, All right? This is gonna be our last section here, All right? And when Wilson is president, here are the different things that are gonna be happening here, All right? Okay, we're gonna talk about most of these, All right? Took out the Federal Farm Loan Act because it's not um, basically just giving loans to farmers, All right? So pretty simplistic, okay? All right, so we're gonna watch our little video here for Wilson, all right, to kind of give us a little bit of background. President Wilson seemed very dissimilar to Teddy Roosevelt. He was a quiet man who didn't seek the public's attention. A 
but in terms of his conviction, determination, and commitment to progressive causes, Wilson was very much aggressive in the course of the tradition. Once he fought hard to lower tariffs in 1914 and other way to the final tariffs, this had to only have been tested on the final and the final of the final and the final of 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 the final Okay, so there was a lot of stuff going on in that video, and um, a lot of those things were reviewed from part one of our notes on the initiative, referendum, and recall. Um, so it's a little longer of a video, but I think it went over a lot of really good things. So definitely try to go through and uh, listen to all the things that that particular person's talking about. All right, so our Underwood Simmons tariff, all right, we remember a tariff, all right, we've talked about it a bazillion times, all right, a tariff is a tax on imported goods, all right, and so what this one is doing, it's just reducing that rate. So we got all the things, it's reducing the rate, we don't need to remember the numbers, but from 37% to 29%. So that's going to allow more trade happening between the United States and Europe. So this is to try and help out the economy. Okay, all right, our Federal Reserve Act, right? This is going to be creating a national bank of sorts, right? But instead of calling it a national bank today, we call it the Federal Reserve, right? So this is the banking system we have today, right? And so this gives the nation a banking system that would be resilient to crisis, right? And it's setting up a re uh, regional banks that will be controlled by a Federal Reserve Board, right? And that board is going to impose regulations that could issue currency and set interest rates, um, and therefore being able to allow credit to the general public, right? You might have heard some things about the Federal Reserve Board in the news recently. Um, they have lowered interest rates um, a lot, right? It's very, very low, and that is to try and help out the economy, since obviously things are a bit of a mess right now. Um, and so they're trying to basically help the economy by lowering those rates, all right, and then they're going to be able to be the ones that control if currency is being printed um, to try and control inflation, right? We're only doing a very surface level analysis of what the Federal Reserve Act is and what it creates, right? Um, as far as all the details of what they do, that's what you talk about when you take economics, right? So we just need a very surface level um, concept of the Federal Reserve, okay? 
so don't stress, right? Our next one, a federal trade commission, right? So trade commission, we're creating a group, okay? And this group is to decide what is fair for businesses to do, right? And they're gonna investigate companies that are going to be doing bad things, right? These companies that are being like robber barons, this group now is a group formed to investigate what they have done. Right? So this is a good thing. So this group is investigates what is going on and to make sure things are fair. Right? And obviously, if they're not fair, right, then they can take legal action against those corporations. Right? In the video, it talked a bit about the Clayton Antitrust Act. Right? We've seen an antitrust act before, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Right? This is fixing the Sherman Antitrust Act. So basically, we're getting rid of Sherman, we're getting now Clayton. Right? And the reason we need a new antitrust act is because that Sherman Antitrust Act was used improperly, right? People were using it to stop labor unions, like in the Pullman strike, right? This now is allowing the government to stop monopolies. However, it also allows them to make sure that they, this law is not being twisted, right? And so there's going to be a board that looks over what is considered a monopoly and what's not, right? To try and avoid what we saw with that labor union strike with Pullman before, right? So that's not going to happen anymore. So this is a good thing for our labor unions. This is a really good amendment, a change to a law that we knew was bad. Right. Our last couple things are going to be social topics, right, that are happening um, during Wilson's term in office. Right. So our first one is the Great Migration. Right. We're going to see a lot of stuff about the Great Migration here and there. If you have taken AP Art History, some of these images here might look familiar. Right. These are from Jacob Lawrence. Right. He is an artist from that Great Migration time period. Right. And so you're going to have um, a large um, population of African Americans moving out of the South during this Great Migration time period. And this is kind of uh, considered 1914 to 1930, right? So before World War I, right? And then ends when we get to the Great Depression, okay? All right, and they're going to these northern cities for industrial jobs, but they're also going out to the west as well. So like San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, and places like that. Um, and so we see this mass migration. So if you remember from other classes you've taken in for like Georgia studies is that um, a lot of African Americans start leaving this time period, getting pushed out of the South because of things like the bull weevil, which was a beetle eating all the cotton, right? You throw in with that that they are sharecroppers, they don't have a lot of money, there is all the racism and lynchings and Jim Crow laws of the South. No wonder that this they, those are major pushes wanting you to get out of those areas, and then these new jobs are going to be these pull factors. So we're going to see more of this great migration and talk about it more when we get to World War I, because that's where we're going to see a really big uptick in people moving to the these new places, right? Um, as far as African Americans in progressive reform, um, they're not really addressed um, very much as a group. Um, and that is just due to that time period, all right? Racism has turned its ugly head again, all right? Wilson himself is actually um, pro-segregation um, and he is going to use those policies in DC. So even though a lot of African Americans had jobs in the DC area, um, they are going to lose those jobs when Wilson becomes president. Um, so some very problematic things happening there, even though there's lots of good things happening during his administration. Um, it's not equally given out to everyone, right? Okay, women are going to get the 19th Amendment or the right to vote um, in 1920, right? And so what we're going to do is a real quick review of women's rights over these different time periods. So on my little chart here, I got first generation, second generation, third generation, right? So first generation is going to be your antebellum time period. So before the Civil War, right? We created the group NASA. Oops, sorry. Um, NASA is the National American Women's Suffrage Association, right? This is the group in 1848 created the Declaration of Sentiments at the, at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York. So think back to those antebellum reforms, think back to the Burned Over District in upstate New York, right? That is your first group. So Susan B. Anthony, her, uh, her silver dollars right here, right? Elizabeth Cady Stanton, right? She's over here. So this idea of you know, women trying to get the right to vote, right? Our second generation is going to be after the Civil War, right? We have Anna Howard Shaw and Carrie Chapman Catt, right? They're going to be the new leaders of NASA. So this group still exists, right? Okay, just new leaders, right? Their main campaign during the se this second generation group is to have a state-by-state -state campaign. So they want every state to grant women the right to vote. Once you get a certain number of states, which is two-thirds, uh, two I believe, right, then it will automatically become a national law, right? So the very first state that will get give women the right to vote is Wyoming, 
right? And so this, this is a good idea, all right? It's not gonna rock the boat too much. The problem is it's going to be very, very slow, right? So that's when your third generation group of women are gonna get involved. So if Alice Paul, this lady right here, right? And Lucy Burns, this lady right over here, right? And they're going to be part of NASA, but they're going to start creating this group called the Congressional Committee, right? And their whole idea is that they want to have a national amendment, an actual amendment to the Constitution. Um, this is going to cause some clash between these two groups here, right? The old and the new, and they're going to break off and create the National Women's Party. So we have a little political cartoon here, the two political parties with a new party being formed, and they're a single issue party. Their only uh, goal is to get a national amendment added to the Constitution. They're going to be doing this by having big parades, right? Um, having speaking events, all types of things like that. Um, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that these women actually will be protesting in front of the White House. So here's a picture of this right here. Right? And when they're protesting in front of the White House, they're going to be having signs um, that are going to be quotes from President Wilson, basically calling out his hypocrisy during this time period, because this is going to be happening during World War I. Right? And during the war, he said we should go to war for democracy. And their biggest objection to this is like, well, how can you go and fight for democracy when you don't have it here at home? Um, and the women will be arrested under false pretenses by protesting in front of the White House. They were actually arrested for obstructing traffic, even though they were on the sidewalk. Um, and when they were in prison as political prisoners, um, they're going to start using civil disobedience, right? And we saw civil disobedience before, right, with Thoreau during the antebellum time period, and civil disobedience is um, not following a law that you feel is unjust. However, you are going to have the consequences of not following that law. So these women in prison will be going on hunger strikes. And um, during these hunger strikes is the Wilson administration realizes that they cannot have martyrs on their hands because that would give too much power to the movement. Um, and so they will be force fed um, for several weeks while they are in prison. Um, eventually, when the war is over, uh, Wilson will have them released and he will grant the 19th Amendment as a war measure to thank the women for all the things they did during World War I. Um, however, it is really these women who are agitating the um, the people in Washington to get this amendment passed. Um, there's a really great movie uh, called Iron Jawed Angels that goes over all of this. Um, I would highly recommend if you need a little break and still want to cover some content, um, I'm sure you could probably find that online. So it's Iron Jawed Angels. It is from HBO, um, but a good movie to watch with that. All right. Um, I'll add some links so here are some links to some other things going on. So here's the trailer to that particular movie. I'll put these links in the description below. All right. Um, our last thing we have here right, for today is to kind of see how religion has kind of evolved throughout all of U.S. history and how we see it um, being used as kind of a pendulum shift to reforms. So if we go way back to that second great awakening, those are the antebellum reforms, that is going to spur then those reforms. We have the Civil War. Populism is a reform. We got the social gospel we talked about in last unit, right? You got the progressives over here, and you're going to kind of see this back and forth religion reform, religion reform, religion reform, right? And so this is kind of a good chart to have. Um, and again, take a snapshot of this if you want to, a screen grab if you wish, um, to kind of give us this idea of like how religion and reform are always going to be tied together, right? Um, and you're always going to see these things happening, right? Um, it's a good kind of flow chart, if you will, of American culture and how we always are going to have religious reforms and social reforms are always going to be um, kind of back and forth from each other. Once we have a religious reform, we're going to change, try to change things, right? Okay, another religious form, we try to change things, right? Back and forth, right? Um, so hopefully uh, this uh, lecture here on the progressive era has been really helpful for all you guys. And um, I'll bring you your next one here uh, soon. And if you have questions, definitely send me those emails with those questions or messages on Remind, and then we can address those questions um, as a review later on, right? Bye-bye, guys.